I'm going to start with one that I know you already know something about. It's the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And we could all sit here all day and talk about the statistics and the innovations and the discoveries that have come from the LHC, especially recently. But I think I've got one better for you. Today we've got uh, Dr. Stephen Myers with us from CERN. Dr. Myers is a native of Belfast, where he was born and raised. He attended Queen's University to get his triple E and PhD from there before joining CERN several decades ago. Now, over his career there, he's led some of the biggest projects at CERN, including the Large Electron Positron and the Upgrade, LEP2. And then in 2008, he took over the Large Hadron Collider, just before the system was turned on, the most advanced system in the world. And now he's focusing on, as the Director of Accelerators and Technology at CERN, not just the LHC, but all the accelerators and all future technology as well, especially in the area of medical advances. Things like Hadron and large ion therapy, which might help us treat cancer very soon. So with that, please welcome to the stage Dr. Stephen Myers, OBE. Okay, can everybody hear me? Good. Okay, I, um, I'm going to talk about the LHC, Higgs boson, and some other things, all in 25 minutes. So, but I start off with uh, what is the mission of CERN, so you know why we're doing this. Um, CERN, of course, is doing research, particle physics research. In order to do that research, we have to be very innovative, and in so doing, we also have a very strong educational uh, program. But the main thing which we do is we unite people from all over Europe, and you'll see later that was one of the premises of the, for the, of the founding fathers of CERN. So the first thing which we are, our first priority is to push forward the knowledge, uh, the frontiers of knowledge. And for example, we study the secrets of the Big Bang, what was matter and the forces which keep matter together, like uh, during the first moments uh, after the creation of the universe. Um, and in order to do this, we have to develop new technologies mainly for accelerators and detectors. But as an offshoot of that, of course, we have to have new technology and information technology. Um, you all know that the World Wide Web was invented at CERN. And more recently, there's, we are using the grid, which is uh, the sort of the father of the, the World Wide Web. And as another spin-off of that, we have found that we can use our technologies for medi medical applications, both diagnosis and, and therapy. So what we do is we train scientists and engineers and technicians of tomorrow. Most people think that CERN is a huge physics institute, but it's actually an engineering endeavor because we build things, and we build things with the help of industry. So it's very much engineering oriented. Um, what we do is, uh, at the center of our mission, is unite people from different countries and different cultures. And on the right-hand bottom side, you see uh, our summer students program where we have about 200 people come for a few months during the summer from 100 different nationalities and work together uh, for a, a period at CERN. So just to give you some background, CERN was founded in 1954. There were then 12 European member states. The premise was science for peace. We're now sort of working on the premise of science for society. Um, today we have 20 members and it's growing. There's still a lot of people in the, in the queue to join the, the organization. Uh, you see here the member states, you see the candidates for accession, associate members. Recently, we have opened, we've opened the, 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 the membership to, to allow people from all over the world, not just from Europe, to come in as members or even associate members. And this has resulted in a large number of applications. Um, we have 2,300 permanent staff, about 1,000 other paid personnel, people who are there for two or three years not, who are not permanent staff. But probably more importantly, we have 11,000 users, as they are called. These are the people that come from all over Europe, from the universities all over Europe, come to CERN for a certain amount of time, do an experiment, and then take the data back home to analyze it. Some of them are there much longer. The people working on the LHC are typically there for maybe years at a time. But on the smaller experiments, they can come for a week or five weeks or six weeks. Total budget for us for 2013 is 1,000 million Swiss francs. It's been very stable over the last few years, which is a very good sign, considering the, the economic times we're going through. Now, I'm going to try to explain why we do all this um, as justification uh, in a few minutes. Um, 
This is not the usual slide which all our theoretical physicists use, but it's my favorite one since I'm an engineer. Um, this is the history of the universe starting in the middle left with the Big Bang. And there are three scales here. I hope you can see them. The, the upper one is time. It starts at zero, obviously, at the Big Bang. And we're now at about 13.7 billion years. The middle one is temperature in, in Kelvin, uh, starting at unimaginable temperatures. And at the moment, uh, almost 14,000 years later, we're at 2.7 K. Uh, the bottom scale is the one the reason why I use this slide, because it's the energy which was in that system at the time. And it's in GeV, giga electron volts, that's a, a unit of energy which we use in accelerators. So that is the reason why I use this is because of this scale. Now what we do uh, with accelerators is we accelerate particle beams to very high energies going along the yellow line. And when we do that, we collide, for example, collide or collide with the stationary target we regenerate the conditions which existed at that time corresponding to that energy. For example, at the moment with the LHC, we are at about 10 to the minus 12 seconds, so a millionth of a millionth of a second after the creation of the universe. That's why I like showing this. So what we do is we regenerate the conditions which existed at that time. We've been doing this for about 80 years, building higher and higher energy accelerators to study what happened at these very fleeting moments just after the creation of the universe. And this just tells you that, this is a summary of what I've said, we recreate in a very small controlled way. We don't go backwards in time as some of the newspapers say, but we recreate the conditions which existed at that time in a tiny way uh, so that we can study them. The detectors, we create the energy. The energy transforms into mass and particles and so on, and the detectors can measure those masses and new particles and forces, and then they, they can uh, derive their theories from that. So this is what it looks like. This is uh, an aerial view of the LHC looking towards the French Alps uh, with Lake Geneva in the background. You can also, if you've got good eyesight, see Geneva Airport just below what's marked LHCB. You also see the detectors. One of them has disappeared on the right-hand side because of the formatting. That there should be an Alice on the right-hand side. There's Atlas CMS LHCB, and you also see uh, that on the very closest to the bottom of the screen is where the the tunnel touches the Jura Mountains, which are west of Geneva. So the LHC is a superconducting proton accelerator and collider. This tunnel, which you see traced out in yellow, is 27 kilometers in circumference. It's on average about 100 meters underground. At the Geneva airport, it's 50, and at the Jura Mountains, it's 150. This tunnel was built for the previous accelerator in 1985. Previous accelerator was an electron-positron accelerator, collider. LHC is a proton-proton and proton-lead collider. So this is what it looks like. Uh, so why did we, when we were designing this, what, we, what were our first thoughts? The circumference is 26.7 kilometers. 20 kilometers of it is filled with the highest field superconducting magnets which we can build. Uh, the refrigerators which cool those magnets with liquid helium uh, consume 40 megawatts of electrical power, just to, the fridge, refrigerator consumes 40 megawatts. If we hadn't used superconductivity, the equivalent machine with the same energy, with classical electromagnets, typically more than four times weaker field, would have had a circumference of 100 kilometers and would have consumed 1,000 megawatts of electrical power. So we would not have been able to build that. We would have not been able to, uh, to run it. This is the accelerator complex, which has uh, grew up grown up over the years, over the last 60 years. In fact, it's the 60th anniversary of CERN next year. Over the last 60 years, you see that we start, if you, again, if you've got good eyesight, you can see the dates of the accelerators. The first reasonable size one is the one in red, just middle bottom right, called PS. And since then, we've been building bigger and bigger accelerators, finishing up with the LHC, which started operation in 2008. Now, Accelerators, as I said before, are building accelerators and detectors is a huge engineering endeavor. And the technologies you need to build these accelerators and detectors are very, very varied and very cutting edge. I have a list here, but it would take quite a long time to go through it. If you just run your eye down it or look at my transparencies afterwards, I try to point out some of the really unusual things. You wouldn't, we certainly need civil engineering because we have to uh, build these tunnels, we have to tunnel these uh, underground. 
we need to very carefully control all components in the tunnel to accuracies which are not needed in any other domain. We, in, in, for the LHC, we have electrical distribution which uses Switzerland and French electrical power. So we have to be able to switch between those. We have to be non-susceptible to electric storms, as you'll see later. Cryogenics, we have 100 tons of liquid helium to keep this stuff 37 million kilos of cold mass cold. And to cool it down, we need 1,260 tons of nitro liquid nitrogen. I'd not go through the whole list. Power converters, very high precision, ultra high vacuum, uh, acceleration system, very high frequency, uh, high power, klystrons, and of course instrumentation, beam feedback, injection extraction, uh, various, very, very cutting edge technology. So this, these are all, every one of these is a huge engineering endeavor. And we have, for each of these, uh, a large number of people, typically of 100 people working on each of these top topics. This is a limited number, I can give you many more uh, later. The, the, the central component, the most important component in the LHC are the LHC dipoles. These are very innovative in that, first of all, they're very high field, um, operation at 8.3 Tesla. Um, they also are twin bores, so it's one magnet with two apertures, one field going down on one side and the other field going up on the other side. So instead of having to build two magnets, we only had to build one, which reduced the cost enormously. These magnets are typically just under 15 meters long. And interestingly, when you cool them down from room temperature down to, um, down to 1.9K, minus 271 centigrade, they shrink by about two inches, each one of them. Uh, this is what they look like in the tunnel. This shows you the inside of the tunnel. Uh, of course, when you connect each one of these 15 meter dipoles to the next one, there's a thing called interconnects. And there are a lot of high technology uh, work which has to go on here to connect the, each one magnet up to another, be mostly because of the shrinkage. We have to ensure um, vacuum uh, continuity, electrical continuity, the continuity for the beam. And during cool down, the whole of the LHC shrinks by 80 meters. So these things have to slide and move and as we cool them down. And this is the most critical stage for us when we're cooling down because this is when we have problems often or warming up. Again, some of the challenges, I'll not go through these again. Two numbers at the bottom, which I'll, I'll they're the only two which I'll, I'll go into some detail because of the time. The stored energy of the beam, each beam has 360 megajoules. And the magnetic stored energy in the whole machine, well, per octant it's 1,100 megajoules, but the whole machine it's 10 gigajoules. Now, I know that probably doesn't mean too much to you, so I'll tell you what the problem is and I'll tell you what, how much energy that is. So how much energy is 10 gigajoules, which is the electrical stored energy in the magnets because they've got 13,000 amperes flowing through them. They have a huge inductance and the stored energy is enormous. So I'll, 10 gigajoules is the same energy as a, an aircraft carrier going at full battle speed. Now, we know that when these magnets are operating, they have to be superconducting. If anything goes wrong, if you lose some protons on them and they warm up, or there's some friction and they warm up, or if you have an electrical storm or whatever, then the magnets can become non-superconducting. And instead of having zero resistance, they will have a resistance. So I squared R will cause lots of problems. Uh, so when we, our, our magnet protection system measures the resistance of all of the coils, if anything goes wrong, we dump this energy as quickly as we can in the tunnel into huge banks of resistors. So we have to stop this aircraft carrier typically in 40 seconds. We have 40 seconds to dump the beam before there's any harm done. Now this is the machine magnet protection system, sorry. The other thing, and it doesn't sound as much, it certainly isn't as much energy, 360 megajoules, but this is in, in the beam which is, has a length of 89 microseconds in time. If you work out that, it's four terawatts of power, which is the whole of the planet's uh, electrical uh, generation, but only for 89 microseconds, it's not for very long. Um, but it gives you an idea. The other thing which you have to realize is this 362 megajoules at the interaction points, the beam has a cross section about the same area as a human hair. So the energy density is higher than anything that you can ever imagine. If you just take the 360 megajoules and work out what it would do to a typical metal, and you take copper and know the melting point, specific heat and so on, you can work out very easily that you can heat up and evaporate 
500 kilos of copper with this beam. Now, as I said before, since it has a very, very small cross section, if this happens, you will end up with a very thin long hole. <laughs> and that's really not what we wanted. So how do you deal with this destructive power? It's very easy. We have the magnet, two, two major mag protection systems. Magnet protection where we measure the resistance. If we have a problem, we get rid of it. We get rid of it in a place where it'll do no harm. Magnet protection system, the machine protection system is a little bit more complicated because any, any piece of equipment on the trajectory of the beam over the 27 kilometers, if it trips or is lost or is an electrical storm or we lose, lose it for any reason, then the beam will be, will be, would be lost in an uncontrolled way. So we have all of these thousands of components connected up to uh, a beam abort, which allows us to trigger a beam dump. It's very complicated. I can explain it to anyone else afterwards. Basically, we, we extract the beam into a, a tangential tunnel 600 meters long, and it ends up on a very large beam dump. Um, so these are the two protection systems. Now, this is where NI comes in. Part of the protection system for us, the most critical part of the protection system is the collimators. What we need to do with, with, with the protection system is generate a place around the machine where if there are any losses, they'll all be lost at this point. So you don't lose them when you're superconducting magnets, you don't lose them elsewhere. So you artificially reduce the aperture with movable collimators. And you put these in close around the beam. Then you know if something goes wrong, you lose them there primarily and you, before you have the beam dump. Now this shows you uh, the schematics very simply of the collimation system. Sounds very simple, just limit the aperture and then you're bound to lose the particles. But these very, very high energy particles, they scatter off, uh, off anything. They go through most things and scatter off everything. So it, it's what we call a, a tertiary collimation system. The beam hits the primary collimator, scatters to the secondary, the secondary picks up the debris, and the debris from the secondary is picked up in the tertiary. We have other things, absorbers and so on. You see the whole list of them here. Now, what is very important is that each one of these have a hierarchy with respect to its counterpart. So the primaries are closest to the beam, the secondaries are a little bit out, the tertiaries are a little bit out, the absorbers are another little bit out, and it has to be very closely uh, controlled. And this is what the collimation system, there are 100, 108 collimators in the machine, this is what they do. Uh, this shows you uh, in this, on the left how tight we have to collimate the beam in order to be sure of this. On the right, you see what the actual collimation system looks like. It's a very small hole through which goes a very hot beam, but you see there's a lot of uh, equipment on the right. This is inside the tunnel. So these collimators intercept the particles which have strayed outside the acceptable limits, and they're in, in what we call uh, interaction points three and seven. So to give you an idea, the, the hole through which this beam with 360 megajoules goes through is, this, is the thing on the bottom left. At injection, it's much wider. When we go up to high energy, we have to bring the collimators in very tight. And the area, the yellow area on the bottom, is more or less the same area as the Iberian Peninsula is on a one euro coin, to give you an idea of the dimensions. And through that goes 360 megajoules. Now, what we did was we were wondering what would happen if some of the bunches, we've got 3,000 bunches in the machine, so the, they're in little packets all around the machine, and there are 3,000 of these. And we simulated uh, what would happen if eight of these bunches actually hit the collimator full blast, not just grazed. And at low energy, we op typically operate at 7 TeV, but eight bunches at 5 TeV you see in the above. And what we found will happen in this situation, well, you'll see it in a moment, but you, you hit this with so much power that you make projectiles of hot, fast, solid tungsten bullets. This thing's made of tungsten. These bullets are at 2,000 degrees, 2,000 K, and they're traveling at one kilometer per second. So if you hit one of these collimators, ah, I should go back. That's what happens. You blast it, and it, it comes out, and you see the distortion on the right-hand side. Clearly, if this happens, we're out for at least a year, maybe longer, because you'll have sputtered uh, you'll have sputtered to, uh, and tungsten all over the machine. The collimation system, uh, which is controlled by uh, NI equipment, um, this gives you some of the ideas. The most important thing here is the bottom, where we, you show that all 108 collimators have to follow the beam from injection through the energy ramp, 
through what we call the squeeze through to uh, collisions. So at each point, the collimators have to move in unison, all 108 together, and you see the traces there of, of on the vertical axis position against time on the horizontal axis. And we need to do this to an accuracy you see in the right, bottom right, about 20 microns is the accuracy to which we have to keep them all with respect to one another. And in the middle right, you see what, what, what these uh, collimators look like. This is just the motorization solution. I don't want to go through the details. Again, you can have a look at this uh, privately. These are some of the control requirements, the axes to control more than 500, uh, positioning sensors, 750, et cetera, et cetera. All of this has to be under very careful control. And the, probably the most important thing at the bottom is, it says reliability, it says very high. That's not very, that's very vague, but it's as high as we can probably ever make it. So these are the conclusions. We used NI equipment for this that has worked fantastically well. And it has, we, it allowed us to, to redesign this, this system very, very close towards the operation of the machine. The collimators were delayed for various technical reasons, and we had to have a control system which worked very well and very quickly with the minimum amount of uh, development. So September 10, 2008, we started up the machine, and much to everybody's surprise, it worked. Um, now, this was great. We were all drinking champagne and having a great time. Um, nine days later, um, when we were making the last step of the dipole current up towards 10,000 amps, the nightmare scenario happened. We had a resistive zone developed. As I was saying, you measure the resistance. There was an electrical arc produced which punctured the helium and the vacuum and all, everything else around it. So basically, what this occurred because one inter-magnet connector out of the 100,000 was badly soldered and this machine protection system, which I referred to, which measures resistance and uh, dumps the beam into these big banks in the, in the uh, tunnel, didn't work. It wasn't sensitive enough for this particular type of accident. So a more interesting thing happened eight days after we, we got the machine running was that they made me director of accelerators and technology. So, <laughs> so I had a very interesting first day at work. We usually line, align these up to about 10 microns. Um, these are beautiful interconnects, which are in pretty poor shape. Uh, the, the total amount of energy here was able to burn, melt, create soot. It, it was just a big electrical arc, and it, it touched the helium enclosure, let all the helium out from 1.9K to, to room temperature. And then when it wasn't the closest earth point, it went to the vacuum through the vacuum beam pipe and punctured the vacuum beam pipe. And of course the vacuum was being 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 10 tor went and sucked in all the soot and debris and everything and polluted the whole vacuum. Then it went to the other one. Uh, and we had uh, 600 meters of damage. So this was in 2008. And this was the reason for it. This was how we make a, a so-called splice. Um, we used to call it a joint, but then a Dutch guy from Amsterdam said, that's not a very good name. Uh, <laughs> so the way you make a splice is you have the two, the two uh, superconductors. Here you see them above and below. And basically you just put three lots of solder, um, one below, one in the middle, and one above. You put the U profile below and the lid on top. You inductively heat the whole thing up and the solder melts and it makes the beautiful um, joint at the bottom. Um, problem is, if you don't put solder in, it doesn't work. And that's what happened. One of the joints had been overlooked. Uh, we had three levels of quality assurance, and somehow or other, it got through all three. The only thing I know is that there were lots of evacuations of the tunnel. Remember, you're 150 meters underground at this point. There were lots of evacuations of the tunnel for, for smoke alarms and so on. I only can only imagine that the team came back and went on to the next magnet and left one behind, and that was, and everybody ticked all the forms. So this is with the repairs. I, again, I don't want to go through this because it would take quite a long time. Um, we had 14 quadrupoles, enormous quadrupoles, 19 dipoles. Uh, elect all the interconnects had to be redone. The vacuum was polluted. The anchor points for the magnets were ripped out. 
um, the pressure relief um, pop-up valves uh, were underdimensioned, and most importantly, the machine protection system wasn't sensitive enough for this. We, during this 14 months of repair, we redesigned the machine protection system and made it 3,000 times more sensitive. And now it is absolutely overkill. It will never happen again. So we got back on March 2010. We had first collisions at 7TV. And here you see the very joyous moment of the first um, events in the four detectors. Uh, so then we started in a new era of, of physics because this is a, an energy which nobody has ever been at before. Uh, and first of all, you see the LHC ring in the bottom, and then you see the, uh, the various detectors, what they look like. They all look very similar. They're all concentric circles of lots of electronics. Um, so for the three years from 2010 to 2012, we started off very gingerly. Um, in the green is 2010. I've amplified the scale by a factor of 100 so that you can see it. Otherwise, it would just look like zero on this scale. Uh, 2011 is red and blue is 2012. So on, to give you numbers, it's 45 inverse Pico Barnes, 2010, 6,000 one, integrated one year later. Integrated luminosity is a measure of the number of events. So this is what the physicists need to, to, to find discoveries. 600 and 23,000 in 2012. And of course, you know that on the 4th of July 2012, two of the experiments announced the discovery of the Higgs boson. So it was a remarkable year. This is the physics letter papers, which uh, appeared in, I think, August 2012, after the announcement on the 4th of July. And even in The Economist, they announced it was a giant leap for science, uh, finding the Higgs boson. For science, not for physics. I think this was a very important point for us. So CERN, particle physics and innovation. Uh, we do interfacing between fundamental science and key technologies. As I said before, our three major technologies are accelerators, detectors, and large-scale computing. And one of the things which I very short mentioned here is medical applications as an example of particle physics spin-off. Um, from the accelerators, we are now studying very seriously the use of much lower, we don't want to hit anybody with an LHC beam, uh, much lower energy beams for tumor, uh, for uh, hadron therapy for, for cancerous tumors. And on the right there, you see a comparison between the conventional radiotherapy and what you would have with protons or carbon ions. The collateral damage is enormously less because of the Bragg Peak. I'm not going into the details. Um, but here, Europe and Japan are world leaders in, in this field, and we're now embarking on a brand new program. Also, the detectors you see here on the left, when, when the beams collide, how they detect where they collide and how they collide. This is also used for medical imaging, and you see PET scans, uh, uh, breasts, doing breast scans for, for women with cancer. Many, many, many other applications here. Another spin-off is the worldwide, the computing, the computing grid. This is where we're connected up to at the moment. Uh, this is the three tier. At the center is CERN. First tier are the uh, very large uh, centers of computing. And tier two is where they do analysis and so on. Just, I don't want to waste time on this, but we're doing, we were doing a year ago, two million jobs per day with very fast uh, network links, 173 petabytes of storage of data. Uh, and that's where we are. Now, now, few slides for the future. Um, at the moment, we're in a long shutdown to, to finish off the repair to those interconnects which weren't properly repaired during the uh, short time we had to get the beam back. Uh, we're doing some other things. We, at the end of next year, 2000, end of 14, beginning of 15, we will then operate at almost twice the energy which we've operated at until now. In the middle term future, we have a, an approved project to increase the performance, that's the integrated luminosity, what I said, the amount of data. This will allow a factor of 10, and we need a lot of new equipment for that, and there's a, a two-year shutdown foreseen in 2020, 2020, 2022, 2023. In the longer term, and you like this, we have the VHC, very high energy LHC, as if the LHC isn't high enough energy. We also have possibility of putting electron-positron collider in there and colliding the electrons against the protons. Um, so we will use the fact that we have to develop very high gradient. You know, we already have high gradient, but we're going for a factor of 2 to 2.5 in the magnetic field using new superconductors, and this is a program over the next 10, 15 years. 
The other thing which we need if we want to do this uh, to get really up to energies of 100 TeV collision, we need to have a bigger tunnel because even with the magnetic field going up by a factor of two, two and a half. So we've had a look at where we would, that tunnel would be and the white one is the present LHC. It looks very small there. Um, the dotted yellow one is an 80 kilometer tunnel. We've now looked at a 100 kilometer tunnel which looks somewhat better. Uh, and this is something which we're considering for the 2050s, uh, that era. So this is my second last slide. It's the impacts of the LHC. Clearly, our first impact is knowledge of the fundamental laws of nature. That's why we do what we do. However, when you build a machine of such complexity, the contracts, for example, on the, the, the impact on the economy, when you build a machine costing 3.4 or 3.6 billion pounds, 40 to 50% of that goes on contracts, which goes back to industry. UK got 12 million per year during the 12-year um, construction. There's a lot of technology transfer to companies that get these new contracts. We also, as I've said before, have a fantastic training and education program. And the thing which has come out recently in yellow here is the fact that the LHC and the Higgs boson and all the rest has been an incredible stimulus to young people to, to take an interest in STEM subjects again. And I, I, I've seen this personally. I mentioned the spin-offs. People don't realize how many accelerators there are in the world. There are more than 30,000 accelerators. The annual commercial output for this, for medical and industrial, is estimated at 500 billion pounds per year. And the World Wide Web, we like to say this because it was invented at CERN, the international economic value has been estimated at 1,500 billion pounds per year. We now have large-scale computing on the grid, and we're now entering the, the medical, health care, climate, energy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Myers.